Surviving a disease that's killed over 400,000 people worldwide is cause for celebration. But surviving is not always the same as recovering. I'm so glad about my post-discharge recovery. It's happened very quickly, but I'm concerned about my fatigue. For some, it's constant exhaustion. For others, heart palpitations or even memory loss. Many former COVID-19 patients grapple with lingering effects long after leaving the hospital. They're learning the hard way that the coronavirus may go, but it can leave a painful trail in its wake. This is DW's COVID-19 special. I'm Kate Ferguson. Welcome. The coronavirus has claimed the lives of hundreds of thousands of people around the world. A far greater number, though, have survived. Today, we'll be looking at the long-term health consequences of COVID-19. But first, here's the story of an old man who defied all the odds to beat the disease. When you're young, it's different. But at the age of 93, what do you have to worry about? He had prepared himself for death. Herbert Hausmann contracted COVID-19 at the age of 93 and fought the disease for more than a month. Well, it hit me hard. I was groggy, miserable, and I was always tired. I lost my appetite. I couldn't eat anything. It all tasted the same, but I didn't feel like eating anyway. During the illness, he lost 12 kilos. At one point, it seemed he would not make it. He had already decided against going to a hospital and intubation. But Herbert fought his way through and pushed himself to go just a little bit further every day with his walker. He had no fear during his illness. I was afraid when I was taken prisoner. I felt fear then, but now with the flu, I wasn't at all afraid. Herbert was a paratrooper during World War II. He says those times toughened him up and that might be why he was able to survive COVID-19 at such an advanced age. We were drilled there. It was tough during the winter. We had to wash ourselves in an open stream. None of us ever got sick. None of us ever got the flu or such things. Besides Herbert, the other nursing home residents with COVID-19 also managed to get through it. Maria Suppes, the care team leader, describes the day they all tested negative again. We were all so happy. Many staff members cried. I even cried too. It was such a relief. It was such a great feeling. Herbert is really looking forward to one thing once the coronavirus is finally under control. I have an electric cart. I'll be happy when I can go to the Rhine River or drive into the city with it. It's been orphaned for eight weeks now and it's going to be very angry with me. They've opened the kindergartens. Uninfected people can gather in groups of 10 or 20. They can go to a bar. Why are older people who don't have the virus not allowed to go out again? One survivor who's rearing to get back to normal life. But what might the future hold for those who've had COVID-19? To find out, I'm joined now by Professor Matthew Bartels. He's the Chair of Rehabilitation and Physical Medicine and Montefiore Medical Centre in New York. Professor Bartels, welcome along. You've had a lot of experience in designing rehabilitation programmes for people who've had COVID-19. Based on the patients you're seeing, what can you tell us about the possible longer-term health implications of this virus? Well, we've actually unfortunately been thrust into the forefront here at Montefiore because the Bronx was one of the early epicenters of the disease. And so we were suddenly confronted with hundreds of patients who had to recover from the condition. Uh, unfortunately, there are many different problems that we see. We see problems with not only pulmonary function, where the patients have a hard time breathing. Uh, this is very much a restrictive lung disease, which means that the lungs become stiffer, so it's harder to breathe, but also it's harder for the oxygen to get into the system. So many patients are sent home or have to do their rehabilitation with oxygen, which is a brand new thing for them. 
Uh, we fortunately see that many of the patients are able to wean off, but we don't know what the long-term implications are yet. But we also see a lot of patients who have had neurological issues. Uh, there's a fair number of strokes, and we've also had patients who have come uh, out of their long intubations and ICU stays with a lot of muscle weakness and other neurologic issues related to peripheral nerves, where they have numbness, tingling, and some weakness that may be attributed to that as well. And then finally, there's a lot of cognitive and depression, uh, as well as anxiety we see, because being in the ICU for very long periods of time can cause um, some of these symptoms. And there's also some concern that there may be some central neurologic uh, effects that are causing some mild cognitive deficits uh, that fortunately also we're seeing are recovering, but do take several months to uh, work through. Now, all of this sounds pretty scary. Tell me about the kinds of rehabilitation programs that you and your team have designed. Well, we start as early as in the intensive care unit with early mobilization. Uh, it can actually even include, uh, during the period of time patients are on the breathing machines and the ventilators, that there's a new thing to actually place them in a face down position or what we call proning. Uh, so our therapists and team get involved early in the ICU start people starting to walk and starting to take care of themselves once they get out of the ICU. But then we transition them, if necessary, to various levels of care. Uh, some patients are able to go home. Uh, those are the patients with milder conditions, but many of them often require some home therapy. And we've arranged that we now have sometimes two or three times a day therapists come to their home to help them. But for patients who have more limitations, we actually have them go to our inpatient rehabilitation facility. And we're fortunate in our system to have Burke Rehabilitation Hospital, which is 150 beds, expanded in the corona uh, emergency to 160 beds. And currently we have over 150 patients that are um, in rehabilitation. And at our peak, we had 90 of those patients, uh, patients just with COVID disease. Now, you so said before, requires, excuse me, go on. I say that that's a comprehensive program of exercise, strengthening, conditioning, and attending to all of the various needs that they have. Right. Now, you've said before that there needs to be a greater awareness about the experience of patients after they've had COVID-19. Are these longer term health impacts being underreported, do you think? Well, I think with the drama of the very, very severe illness that COVID can cause, a lot of people are very caught up with the mortalities. Uh, but I think that unfortunately we haven't focused on the survivors as much because the uh, patients, you know, maybe one or two percent may actually have fatality and five or six percent end up in the emergency room and then in intubate in the ICU. Those patients, many of them are survivors, but they do need this long-term rehabilitation. And that hasn't been the focus yet. Although I think now, starting now, some more attention is coming to this. Professor Matthew Bartles, thanks so much for your insights. Oh, you're very welcome. Time now to answer your questions about COVID-19. Over to our science correspondent, Derek Williams. Has antibody testing been used to successfully contain cluster outbreaks in past epidemics? Serological testing is one of the tools that epidemiologists have used for decades to, to track the course of outbreaks and, and to inform decision making. For example, I found a study from 2010 carried out by Thai researchers on the H1N1 outbreak that was aimed at helping to manage vaccination in that country. Um, but I couldn't find any evidence that past serological surveys have been used in the way I think you mean, to, to keep a kind of ongoing score of, of who might be immune and, and who's not, to help experts to manage local outbreaks before they spin up. In fact, it, it seems to me that our, our lack of experience in using antibody testing to try to control cluster outbreaks is actually the reason there's so much confusion surrounding the topic at the moment. Wouldn't selecting a large number of healthy people and infecting them purposely be a quicker and safer way to reach herd immunity? 
This idea has big potential downsides, both ethical and logistical. Um, first and foremost, of course, there's the problem that, that any infection with this virus can be possibly lethal. Um, by intentionally infecting even young volunteers with it, you might kill them, even if the risks are much lower than they are for someone who's older. Um, there's also the possibility that some volunteers could suffer long-term effects, long-term health effects. We still don't know much about those. Then, of course, there's the issue of, of keeping things under control. It's, it's too easy to imagine scenarios where you let the genie out of the bottle and cause, cause way more harm now than you would theoretically cause good somewhere down the road. So, all in all, pretty much everyone in both science and politics thinks trying for this controlled herd immunity uh, just isn't an option. Given that men are more severely affected than women, do hormones play a role in the severity of COVID-19? This has been a key question ever since we discovered that men die from this disease much more often th than women do. Um, could estrogen or progesterone be, be playing a protective role of some kind? To find out, a couple of studies in the U.S. have doctors giving male patients doses of those female sex hormones to see if they help lower risk of severe outcomes. Um, on the opposite track, many researchers are looking at whether higher levels of male sex hormones, like testosterone, which is an, an androgen, could be contributing to worse outcomes. One study in Italy, for example, found that that men with prostate cancer who were taking drugs to lower their androgen levels, they were only a quarter as likely to get COVID-19. So it seems quite possible that hormones do play a role in catching the disease and also in its severity, but, but we don't know exactly what role yet.